Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another episode of The Risk Matrix. The Risk Matrix. Roll Tide. Roll Tide 2024. Roll Tide. And, Where legends and that, are made. <laughs> and I just want to let you know, that's James Junkin, if you didn't know that. And I'm Dr. Martin, and we're here um, to talk with Dr. David Daniels um, in a second here. Um, welcome to the matrix, Dr. Daniels. You are in the matrix, baby, as James yay. likes to say. Yay. Yay. Hopefully I take the right pill today. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. The red or blue one. We don't care. We want your opinion. Right. Um, so let me just, well, let me just roll us in here. Um, this episode of the risk matrix powered by Veriforce is sponsored by with you 2024 is here. And many of us are making new year's resolutions. Me too to get in shape and improve our health. With You is on a mission to empower the world to choose fitness. Through the With You On Demand app, fitness is accessible and an enjoyable experience for everyone at every stage of their fitness development. The With You app provides audio guided workouts across countless disciplines from Pilates to strength training to yoga, from, from rowing to stretching, you are led by world-class coaches. Reduce stress, improve your mood, better get better sleep, and improve your fitness with the With You app. That's With and capital U, With You app. To learn more about this exclusive offer, visit With You, that's With, capital U, training.com forward slash Veriforce. And that's our read for today, our sponsor, James. And um, again, I want to welcome Dr. Daniels to the show. We're going to talk about psychological safety and a recent article that came out and probably a bunch of other things too. So James, want to start us off? Absolutely. Welcome, Dr. Daniels. Uh, uh, it's our honor to have you here on our show. Uh, probably most of our listeners recognize you from your presence on social media, but if not, uh, those of you that are unfamiliar with Dr. Daniels, Dr. Daniels holds a PhD in occupational safe and he uh, health and safety and is certified as a safety director, violence prevention specialist, emergency management specialist, safety and health specialist, and certified in mental health first aid. He is a past member of the National Safety Council's Board of Directors and is a recipient of the National Safety Council's Distinguished Service to Safety Award. He is also chair of the National Association of Black Compliance and Risk Management Professionals, Safety and Security Work Group, Dr. Daniels is an internationally recognized expert on psychological safety, psychosocial hazards, and is the host of the podcast, Psych Health and Safety U.S. podcast. He also serves with myself and Dr. Martin on the Bear Force Strategic Advisory Board. Welcome to the Risk Matrix, Dr. Daniels. Right on, and, and thanks to, to to both of you. Uh, it, it's, it's an honor to be able to... Uh, to join the list of folks on this uh, on this podcast, particularly YouTube, because so as we're getting into introductions, uh, there is uh, there is a universe, and I think it's a real a real universe where I would not be having this conversation if it, if it were not for the two of you, uh, particularly my uh, my friend and, and mentor, Dr. Martin, who got me through that whole process, uh, that whole doctoral thing. Um, as and I'll just choose my advisor, and so any anything that I talk about and help others do in this regard, it certainly goes back to her because there's a bunch of people who would not have helped me to that extent. And then James, to you for introducing me to you know the strategic advisory board and the and the concept and process that's going on around the board. It's uh, it's unique, you know, and I like being involved in unique things. So thanks to both of you for for having me. Well. Well, you're you're welcome pretty and unique you have a yourself, in my, and uh, in my life. I appreciate it. Me and Dr. Martin step on each other all the time in this podcast. Hey, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be quiet now. I just want to say, you know, namaste. Right. Absolutely. Well, I'm in that process too, Dr. Mar uh, Dr. Daniels. Uh, she is abusing me in my doctoral <laughs> studies, uh, challenging me, uh, making me want to pull what's left of my hair out. But eventually she says, if you just trust the process, you'll end up getting through this. So yeah, I'm in yeah. the early stages of um, our doctoral projects and research at Columbia Southern. 
But uh, both of you are, are definitely inspirations to me and mean a lot to me, not only professionally, but personally. Right on. Dr. Yeah. Daniels had a whole head of hair when he started with me. <laughs> whole head of hair. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Let's uh, off to the other topic now. <laughs> right. Let's do that. Let's do that. So James. my first question is surrounding psychological safety and psychosocial hazards. Many of our listeners have heard of this, at least conceptually. It's a huge buzzword. I would say second only to uh, the renewed interest in serious injuries and fatalities. But if you go to these conferences like all of us go to or, or have occasion to speak, you'll see on the menu of speakers at least some, some sessions devoted to psychological safety and some sessions uh, devoted to SIF. So it's super popular right now, but I'm not sure we all understand what psychological safety means. A lot of times people equate this with mental health and yes. suicide and things of that nature. Sure. You're sure. the expert. Tell us sure. what psycho psychological safety is and psychosocial hazards are. So, so the I, I think the the thing that's avant garde is uh, you know trendy. Folks like to talk about it is the psychological safety piece, and you know that was uh, predominantly Dr. Amy Edmondson's work. Harvard Business Professor wrote the book The Fearless Organization and talks about the importance of having a, an environment people can contribute, bring their whole self, and not have to worry about being picked on by the folks that they're giving their whole selves to. While that's, tr again, trendy, important, all of that, uh, Dr. Edmondson is not and was not a safety professional when she made that distinction. She's a leadership and management professor and great at her work. I mean, it is one of the more important concepts that's uh, that that I've come across in a while, but I'm not a. I've done some management and leadership. You know, uh, folks might question even me some days how effective I ever was, but uh, I am a safety person, <laughs> and from a pure occupational or environmental health and safety perspective, people are missing the boat when they only talk about psychological safety, and don't talk about what it takes to get it and keep it. And that's where my research around psychosocial hazards and psychosocial hazard mitigation particularly comes in. Uh, and I found in, my, in the research, I found folks all over the world have all these different definitions. And most of them, in my view, were simply lists of what a psychosocial or, or what a psychosocial hazard might be. And so, you know, as we tend to do in, the, uh, in our doctoral journeys is add to the body of knowledge so my ad was a psychosocial hazard is a psychosocial factor that is perceived or experienced by the person exposed as a threat that in turn affects their behavior. It has to have all that stuff. There has to be a perception or experience on the part of the person at the time they're being exposed that they think is threatening that then affects the way they behave. Because if it's not all that, that, that it's really not a hazard because a lot there are a lot of things in either of our cases. So we're we're three different people born in different places, having different experiences. We could be in the very same environment and the same set of facts might be a threat to one of us and not to the other. And it doesn't make us bad. It doesn't make you bad either. It just says it's a threat to me based on how my brain works, based on my experience, based on what my you know what's going on in my life at the time. It's a threat to me. And that threat causes me, that perception of threat causes me to act in a certain way. Because if I don't act in a certain way, I mean, we, we have all kinds of feelings all the time. But it doesn't really motivate me enough to do anything. And when it starts to motivate me to do things, and I'm doing those things to protect myself from a threat, that, because if we go back and talk about, you know, uh, hearing conservation or respiratory protection, there's a lot of stuff in the air that's not necessarily a respiratory hazard, if, unless I get too much of it or unless it's in a confined yeah. kind of space. You see what I mean? So that's that that conversation about a psychosocial hazard, that's what's going to get us psychologically safe and keep us there. And that's also what's going to stop us from getting there and eliminate whatever psychological safety we may have. So so I, I just want to interject here, ask a question. Um, so what you're saying is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, right? What you're saying is 
Uh, psychosocial hazard is very personal, right? It's a very totally. personal thing. Totally. Three of us in the room, it's a very personal experience. And now let's say we have a work team, right? We have a work team of, uh, let's say eight people, right? And we've got highly personalized experience of what psychosocial hazards are. And we're trying to create psychological safety within that work team, right? right. And how, how do we, how do we, ex how do we help each other experience what these psychosocial hazards are in order to get to the place of psychological safety? And, and I'm just talking about a small work team, right? right? People are talking about this in the context of an organization, okay? Right. Multi-million dollar corporations with global places all over the place. And we're talking about personalized experiences put together to create a psychological safe space, right? How, yes. how do you do that? I mean, is it just within your team? Is it within your, your region? Is it, how, how, I mean, it, it, it seems it, like undoable. Uh, it is very doable, but it's all, it's everything you just said, but it, it's like, um, uh, Safety is always a personal thing, and it always starts with me. It always does. I, I, as I've, I've shared this with folks before, as a safety professor, it's not my job to make other people safe. I'm, that's not my job. It, it's not my job. My job is to keep myself safe and to, uh, for those who are interested, to provide them information, resources, things that so they can make a decision themselves. Because ultimately, that's what it boils down to, and. If we're trying to create a psychologically safe environment for everyone, the first person who's got to be safe is me. I have to know what's important to me. I have to know what, you know, sometimes what triggers me? What why am I feeling this way? And and often I I I I see circumstances where people skip over themselves and try to fix everybody else. And you aren't feeling psychological safe. Well, I'm really the one who's stressed out. I'm really the one who's having the challenge in my own life. But then I kind of ignore that, skip over and say, well, let me let me talk to James. Let me talk to Logan. Let me talk to all these other people and see if I can help them out. I can only help other people out of my abundance. I've got to have a little bit of extra. And, and so to, to, it starts with me. Uh, well, you know what? What what gives me peace and joy and happiness? And what who are the types of folks I like being around? And what are the stories I like to hear? If I don't know that myself, it's very difficult to have this conversation with other people. But once, let's assume that I'm I'm cool. I get me. I like me. I feel good about me. Now it's how do I create that environment with the other person or persons that are in the room? And we do that primarily by communicating what works for us and what doesn't. It's really that simple. Often we get deposited. So the three of us get deposited in, into a system that was not built by us. It was built by whomever, but it wasn't us. And we yeah. all get, you know, parachuted into it. And then we start doing particular things because the system says we're supposed to. And we never stop to go, well, what's going to work for us? First of all, why are we here? What is it that we're here to accomplish as a group? It's not, and, and this is not about what you're supposed to accomplish or what I'm supposed to accomplish. It's what is it that we are trying to do? It's I mean, take take it into any kind of relationship, whether personal, professional, whatever it is, both parties in the relationship or all parties in the relationship have to contribute to what the goal is going to be. It's not going to work with you telling me, oh, you'll be happy if you do this. You'll love it. I might not. And if I don't have the opportunity to contribute to that, you'll never be able to fix it for me until I get a chance to contribute. But then you've got to contribute as well. And then what we contribute is what we do. That's how it starts. Not this command and control. I'm the CEO boss and I will tell everybody what to do. You know, I, I don't really give a crap about what, about what you want. I care about what affects me. I really do. We all do. And right. you're not going to, I'm at the stage in place and stage in my life. Nobody makes me do anything. I do what I want. And if I don't want to do it, I'll just not do it. Cause you can't make me. I mean, last I heard there was an emancipation proclamation signed it back in the 1860s or so. So you can't own me. It's yeah. either we're going to contribute or you're going to do whatever. And I'm going to go do something, something else with folks who allow me an opportunity to contribute. That doesn't mean I get what I want all the time. It just means right. that we have to agree on what we're going to do. Well, in a past yeah, life, I used to coach football and yeah. I love coaching football. And this was back before coaches made 
10 million dollars a year for going four and seven and then get fired and have a guaranteed you know 10 year 50 million dollar contract or something back then you you didn't make hardly any money uh but you did it for the love of the game right and so uh, when i think of that experience in the organization that we had you know everyone came to that organization and team from different perspectives different life experiences different physical abilities uh, different, uh, if you want to go back and say, hey, the experience that they have even being on the team. You know, you've got a freshman player. That's not the same as a senior player, uh, just based on the maturity type level. So back those days, uh, the big big bug word in, in business was, I treat everybody the same. And fortunately, I had a head coach that says, I don't treat everybody the same. I treat everybody fair because not everybody's the same. And I, it opened my eyes. It's like, wow, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Because some people, when we're getting ready for the game, they needed that raw, raw speech to get them fired up. Right, right. Some right. people we had to calm down. Right. They were too emotional. Right. You know, you can play with emotion, but you can't play emotional. Because if you do, you make a lot of mistakes, a lot of errors and things. And, and I think that can translate maybe somewhat to business. And I wanted your thoughts on that right. of, hey, do I have to treat everybody the same or can I find out what works for Dr. Daniels as a leader and motivate him? So um, let, let me, you, you've kind of opened the door to another conversation that I get invited to uh, ever so often. <laughs> uh, so I, I live in a country when I walk in the door, people don't, you know, they, they tend to see how I look and they assume that you know, I have a lot of opinions about like diversity, equity, and inclusion because I'm a black person. And I do, I, I, but I know a bunch of other stuff, but that's what I get asked to talk about because, and I'm okay with that, to be frank, because I, I, I get it. But you're never going to get, James, what you just talked about, you're never going to get that unless you can identify, A, what is it we're trying to do as a group? That's why I'm here. But what is this, what is affecting this person? What is this person good at? So every, you know, you, there's some people whose bodies are bigger. They probably shouldn't be a defensive back because their body style, it's not that they're not a great athlete, but they, they, they do something different. And so why would we put the 300 pound, six foot eight person back as a free safety, you know, trying to chase down somebody who's 180 pounds. That doesn't make the big, bigger person, a bad person. It seems they're out of position because that's not how they were created. That's not how they're designed. That's not what gives them joy and peace. We do the same thing in business. We say, oh, yeah. So the example is, I'm going to start a business. I'm a dude. I'm going to bring in, you know, other people probably like me. But then as soon as I bring a woman in, I go like, well, she's got to be like us. That's that's the, that's the problem. She doesn't have to be like us. She has to be herself. Whoever she, who, whatever, if, if the person is, uh, we, we're all able-bodied people. We bring in somebody disabled and then we try to create these things that make them like us. Great organizations. Someone one someone told me this once and I, I never forgot it. What great organizations do is instead of trying to make the new person become like the organization, the organization starts to become like the new people. Because if you didn't want different people, you could have just hired a bunch of clones of the same thing. See how that that there are some things that organizations do that need a particular skill set, a particular that's great. But when you invite somebody who's different that you said because you hired them or because you brought them on because you invited them, you said they had something to contribute, and then you try to make them something that they're not, and then wonder why it doesn't work for them, why they feel uncomfortable. And so we've got to do both. It, it both treating people the way that they are and treating them equitably, which is a little bit even different from fair, is giving what does that person need to be effective in the thing that we decided they were gonna do. Not that I decided. We decided that this person was gonna be an admin assistant, a vice president or whatever. We decided that because work is simply an exchange. I have some skills, you have some resources and we're doing an exchange. That's what it is. Again, like I said, you don't own me. You certainly don't own, and you certainly don't have access to anything else. This, and I, and I gotta say this before we, I, I I think I I'm starting to struggle with this idea about bring your whole self to work. I can't bring my whole self there. You're not set up to take hold the all of me. So what do you say that for? 
Why don't you say yeah. bring the why don't I you like say that. bring the portion of yourself that will help us get what we did? Come on, let's be honest. None of us. There are things that we would never do at work. Frankly, I'm always going to be clothed at work. Unless I was in a, <laughs> unless, unless I was in a strip joint. But that if my job requires me to wear a uniform or to wear clothing, I can't bring my whole self and not like show up without it. And that doesn't yeah. Seriously, and that doesn't make me weird because I run around in the sh in in my house not without as many clothes on. That's I just right. don't bring that to that environment. That's all, right? See what I mean? So, so I guess how do you? How, look, okay, the reason <laughs> I'm laughing is because James and I had this conversation before you jumped on about nobody makes us do anything either. Okay, so we're three people in a room. Okay, and and we when you said that it just and I'm sure James just it went right to his heart too. Look, ain't nobody going to make Dr. Martin do what Dr. Martin doesn't want to do, okay? You don't owe me. I don't care if you pay me money. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't care about any of that. I'm, you know, I'm probably not the best employee, right? So, so how do you, when you got a bunch of people like that in a room, right? And they're like, they're, they have to cloak, right? I have to cloak in the workplace because not yeah. because of how I look, or who I am, but because my personality, and I know this about myself, is so incredibly strong that I don't feel safe unleashing that. Right? Yeah, okay. Okay. So so and I and I would think you know, James works for himself as well, right? And and we all work for ourselves. That's that's an interesting thing here too. <laughs> but I can't walk into a client's place or a, a workplace and bring that whole Dr. Martin that fills the room because I can fill a room. I can fill six rooms and I think James can, and I think you can. So what do you do with that? Right? Because you've got that kind of cloaking going on, but then you've got the subtle cloaking going on with the people who bring, they don't fill a room, right? But they're still cloaking right. small parts of themselves. Right. It, it, it goes back to why, am I in this room? Why am I here? Why am I having conversation with this person at this moment? What, what is the point? But uh, you know, as the, the coveyism about begin with the end in mind, what, mm -hmm. why am I here? So again, there was a reason I decided to take this meeting, go into this room. And that was my decision. That wasn't theirs. They didn't force me to do it. I did it. And I, and so if I'm going to do that, I, I have to be thinking about the entire time. What is it that I'm here to get out of this? Mm -hmm. And what is it that, because I don't know what they want. I know what I want out of it. And it, th there's, that's why there's a benefit of having these conversations up front about what it is that we want to achieve. So uh, I, 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 I go into work with a client who says, look, we're having some issues around, you know, we don't like, really like our culture. It's, you know, we want to change it. It's not my challenge, it's theirs. It's not my issue. They're not bullying and mistreating me because I wouldn't put up with it. So, but they are doing that to each other. So they bring me in to help them. And if if I if I know I'm going into a, 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 a situation and they've got some conflict with each other, then there's no need for me to fill the room with my peace and joy. I keep it to myself because they're not ready for that yet. You see what I mean? And and Slowly, but they'll get more of it as as I take them down the road and as I get them to experience, you know what? Yeah, you all are doing that. You don't really have to do that. There's another option. Really? Is there? So it's this constant assessment of why me and the other person or me and the other group, why are we here and what is it that we're trying to do? Because of course, nobody, the only person who can take all of me all the time is me. That's it. That That includes the human being that I've been, you know, in a committed relationship for 35 years. We can't take all of each other all the time. There's sometimes I don't even talk to her and she'll talk to me either. Mm. But, 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 but that doesn't mean uh, that's really how it's worked for us is we've decided we're kind of committed to this thing, but we're not, we're not trying to be something that we're not, I'm not trying to make it. She's a very private person. Matter of fact, if she knew I was even saying this, she'd go, oh, she's a very private. I'm not so much. So I can't drag her around to a bunch of things. She didn't want, okay. That that's not so again, it is about both parties knowing why they're in that conversation, in that room, in that role, in that business. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you get hired on, brought into a company or, or an organization or what have you, 
And sometimes uh, the, the biggest issue is you're not told up front why I'm really here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Why am I really here? Don't tell me. I know what the average, but why am I really here? Then I can decide whether or not I really want to continue to be here or whether I even want to accept the job. Be honest. Yeah. This job is very stressful. This job is really, there's some days it sucks. It's awful. But when those days happen, here's how we're going to support you. When I became a firefighter nearly 40 years ago, <laughs> they told me we we're going to go to buildings on fire. I got that part. We talk about that all the time. We did all kinds of stuff to get prepared for that. What they didn't tell me about is the dead people I would see. That I never, I was 21 years old, had never seen a person die in my entire life. Not being present, seeing a person that I'd seen persons at funerals, but I had never been there when somebody took their last breath. And that is a thing. That is a thing that affects people different ways. And I could I continue to repeat that all these years later because. That's what I saw first. I'm 21. We show up at this guy's house. He's having chest pain. He's talking to us. And by the time we leave, he's dead. That, but they never said that. They didn't. And so I got to go and process it. Well, wow, that was weird. No, did I do the right thing? I'm questioning myself. And da, 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 because that's not the conversation that we had, or we didn't have enough of it. So it's about having the conversation up front. Why are we here? What is it that we're trying to, we're trying to get done? And what's my contribution? Then I know how much of, you know, myself to give. I know what to give I, because it's not really appropriate for this particular group because it doesn't help us meet our goal. So, mm -hmm. you know, as this has become more well-known within the business community and certainly the safety aspects of this we'll get to in this conversation, a lot of companies are trying to, as CEOs and general managers, as executive C-suite people say, you know what? We want to institute psychological safety. You know, we, we've already hired these people within our organization, but maybe we're we're doing things that are is is making people feel like they can't speak up and et cetera. And you hear this all the time. It's like you have the right to stop the job, you have the obligation to stop work, you're not gonna have retribution. Yeah, and sure. then once you dig into into an incident investigation, you find out, well, we may have said that. But we what know. we're putting off is encouraging that. And we just had a recent uh, fatality that Dr. Martin and I were involved in. And once we assessed the, the psychological safety aspects and, and cultural safety, or, uh, cultural um, organizational uh, culture of that organization, what we found was that in certain demographics, even though we said it, they didn't feel it. Right. 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 So regardless of whether it's safety or not, if I'm a leader, how do I create, what are some things that I need to do to create the, the culture, the organizational culture where people can use their voice and right. the best ideas can win? So uh, first of all, many and I think I may have mentioned this before, but it bears repeating many organizations that exist today were not designed for the psychological health and safety of the people who are there today. It was designed back in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s. You know, I hear companies talking about, I've been around for 125 years. When I hear that you're around for 125 years, I do the math. That says you're around in the early 1900s, late 1800s. That was not a great time for people like me. So that didn't, that didn't that, matter of fact, I, it was legal at that point. For you didn't even have to hire. Me. So that doesn't do a whole lot for me. And I, I, I'm not suggesting that you said that to be provocatory or to be negative. You said that because that's a, that's a state of, uh, that's a statement of, uh, something good for you. It just wasn't for me. And again, it doesn't make you a bad person. So we have to look at how was this system designed in the first place? There are systems that were designed so women would not be comfortable there because nobody thought, and I I, I'll say it, the fire rescue service is one of them. There are many people today, well, women shouldn't be firemen. The whole, first of all, it's a firefighter. And of, no, 
<laughs> and there are people who believe that today. And there are systems that have been put in place to ensure that, that that's what happens. And so how was it designed in the first place? So we can't take what was not designed to be psychologically safe and make it that way simply by the force of our will. It's gonna require either, either the redesigning of the system with new folks in mind, or a total, total teardown of what we have that includes the people that it wasn't designed for. And generally it's gonna take a little bit of both. It's gonna take both. Time. Because, so the Occupational Safety and Health Act when it was passed in 1970, only 2% of the people who voted on it look like me. <laughs> so that, that was not built to make sure that the workplace was safe for Black people. We were, again, uh, only six years before to have the, the, you know, the legitimate legal right to be able to get the job. So, and again, I'm not saying that, to, again, to be provocative. That's just the facts. That's the way that things were at the time. So we can't now say, you know, 60 years, oh, we're just going to take that and polish it over. It doesn't really work for everybody because it was designed by everybody. So if you want it to be safe for whoever that new person is, whoever that demographic is, whoever that different, they have to have the opportunity to contribute as to what safety for them is going to feel like. Some of that happens right on the scene. Some of that happens in the policy. Some of that happens in training. But it has to be this constant inclusion is not just inviting me to the dance. <laughs> it's asking me to come out on the floor with you. Yeah. So so I want to, because James was James had a good point earlier um, when we were talking about this. Um, what do you do when the leader comes into the room, right? And their intent, their intent is to make things psychologically safe. Th their intent is to hear your ideas, but really in their mind, they already know which way they want to lead that conversation um, <laughs> to, I, get I just, to get a result. Can I right here as you're doing that, yeah. that, that particular thought? Because yep. uh, it goes along with an article, Dr. Martin, you're super smart, uh, that that was in Harvard Business Re Review here recently in December uh, 5th, uh, 2023, by Ron, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name, Karachi, I think that's how you uh, pronounce it, but how leaders fake psychological safety. And I, th I think that we, we can discuss that word fake, but I think that goes along with, in a good segue, your question is a good segue into the discussion about this article. So I'm sorry, Dr. Martin, go ahead. No, no, no that's okay. I mean, I, I was getting at um, maybe, okay, maybe people go in with the intent of faking it, right? Like, okay, you can stop the job, but what I really mean is you really can't stop the job. And in my mind, I'm just saying it because it sounds good. OSHA wants to hear it, all the all these other kind of things. But I'm talking also about the people who come in and, you know, uh, uh, older school people. And, I, you know, I mean, I hate to put it into a generational thing, but you come in and you got 40 years experience and, and you're like, I want to hear everybody's opinion. But you really know, really know in your heart of hearts, this is what you want to do. And you're trying really hard to listen to other people's viewpoints and, and opinions to, to make it safe for them. And the intent is there to make it safe, but you're not really, you're not changing what's inside in order to make that, that change. What do you, what do you do with that? So uh, again, another, again, obviously my favorite author, um, I think was Stephen Covey's son that in a book called The Speed of Trust, if I'm not mistaken, that suggests that we evaluate ourselves based on our intent. We evaluate other people based on what they do. And then here's something I've added to it because I don't think it was in the book. And then we assign intent to it. <laughs> I don't really, I don't know what your intent was. And frankly, there's a part of me that says, I don't even really care what your intent was. I care how it makes me feel. I can't do anything with your intent. I, again, I can't make you believe. And, and frankly, we have a compliance-based approach to safety in this country. That's, we just do. A lot of people do things because they have to. And frankly, I don't really care if you're doing it because you have to. But we don't have to, in the United States, we don't have to make it psychologically safe. We have to make it physically safe. But we don't have any laws that say you have to make it psychologically safe. And that's the discussion we're having now is perhaps we should. But 
the issue is, uh, <laughs> the issue is, I don't know what your intent was. And it really doesn't even matter what your intent was. It matters how whatever it is that you're doing causes people to feel emotionally, psychologically, physically, that, that, that type of thing. And in order to know that, they we have to get data around that. And, and a lot of there's a lot of safety conversation that is uh, quantitative in nature. There's 10 percent of this and 5 percent decrease in that and blah, 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 which is, you know, as, as Dr. Martin may, may remember, the reason why I didn't want to do quantitative research, because you can throw all the numbers in the world at me. If I don't feel it, it doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't. I mean, you can tell me all kinds of graphs and charts and I'm not, I, I, I ain't feeling that. So I'm not going to do it. I got. I have to feel it. I have to feel it. So I, I, I really, I really believe it's just so ultimately important that we involve people in assessing what the obstacle is, and not assume just because whatever my intent is. It doesn't mean it. Might, I've said and done things in my life that I intended to be helpful to people, and when I after it came out of my mouth, they were pissed off. I didn't know. It doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter what my intent was. That's just where it landed with them. The question is, what are we going to do with that if I don't get it right? It'd be better on the front end for us to have a deeper conversation about, you know, what again, what is it that we're trying to do? How do you work best? What type of environment works best for you? And I hear a lot. I can hear a bunch of CEOs, their head exploding around. What's the time to do all that stuff? Yeah. Uh, OK. Yeah. You better make time. Because there are folks right now, if you don't do that, they're not going to work with you. If you're not going to there's take not the a lot of there's not a lot of labor out there, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, so, and, 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 and frankly, there's not a lot of labor out there who's going to put up with that. So <laughs> I think, and and I struggle with this. I want people within my organization, Dr. Daniels, Dr. Martin, to speak their minds. And be okay to be passionate about it. Yes. But I didn't get in this chair because I don't have good ideas myself. A absolutely. Okay. You didn't absolutely. get to where you are without being extremely competent and qualified to do your job. You two are some of the most recognized experts in your fields. So now in an organization, when you insert the CEO as the 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 person who had the ingenuity, the drive, the expertise to build an organization. And that's what this article is talking about, right? This article's got the CEO of a global financial services com company bringing his management team together to say, I I'm not sure how best we should proceed. What are your ideas when we all know, already know how the best we should proceed? That's the problem. That's, yeah. That's the problem. I've yeah. already made up my mind as to how we should best proceed because I'm I'm the one that built it. I'm responsible for it. I'm accountable for it. Right. Right. So when I come in the scenario in this in this particular arc, I love this arc. I'm not sure I would use the word fake because I don't think people intentionally. Back to your word, intentionally. Right. I'm not intentionally going to this meeting to crush my team, but it's an exercise. That is really unnecessary because I've already made up my mind what we're going to do. So how there's do a bridge that. How do we get beyond that where we're trying to create? I know what this guy's trying to do. He's trying right. to sit in a meeting and get people to say what's on their mind, their feelings, or whatever, but he's already made up his mind. So it's there's an exercise. There, there is an article that I read. I, th I don't remember if it was an op ed or something, and it was in the Seattle Times, and it would have been 25 years ago, but I never forgot it. It talked about pseudo participative decision making. <laughs> pseudo participative decision making is are these meetings that we all go to so we can all nod our head to say we agreed to something that we really don't agree to because we all know the CEO has his or her mind made up already. Pseudo participative. It's the survey that we pass around to everybody and see what everybody thinks, but we're not going to do any of it anyway, but we do it because we got to have an annual survey. It's Pseudo participative decision making creates an unsafe, a psychologically unsafe and unhealthy environment in and of itself because it doesn't allow other people to contribute to the decision itself because it's not real. 
if you don't want my opinion, don't ask for it. If you want to make the decision yourself, make it. But let's not have a let's don't question me then. Just do it. You can do that. There, I, I worked with an individual once who, um, and again, I'll say it because I'm feeling bold today. Uh, this is one of my, you know, fire fire service who would tell everybody he was a fire chief all the time. I'm a chief. Every I I I thought I can't recall ever having a conversation without him having to mention he was a chief all the time. If you have to remind people you're the CEO all the time, who are you trying to convince, you or me? I think you're trying to convince you, because I get it. I mean, I understand, I'm not trying to challenge that, but because of your own insecurity, because of your own lack of confidence in your abilities, you got to remind yourself and everybody else all the time that you are the boss. Guess what? If you're the boss, why you hire these other thousands of people? If you know and can do everything yourself, do it yourself. Don't involve other people if it's real, because no matter how smart you are, I consider myself to be very intelligent. I really do. And there's a thousand things I have no idea how to do, which is the reason that you get engaged and involved with other people. Because I, even if I could do it, even if I have the capacity to do it, I may not have the time. I may not, ha I may not have done it in a while. So th this is how we show value in the relationship with other people is, I, look, if I ask you a question, because I really don't know, and generally I'll take whatever you say, because I don't know. And if I don't trust you, you shouldn't be in the room in the first place. So, it, so you're recommending, if I get this right, as a leader, as a CEO, do not have these exercises where you're pretending to get people's input. Only if you don't do really that want if you're willing to get people's input. Yes. Now yes. you may get their input and you may say, mm, I don't know that that's the best path forward, right? The best well, idea. Be clear is about that. Be. Just be, 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 be clear about that. And the other thing, look, is your action speaks so loud, I can't right. hear a word that you're saying. And if you're constantly asking for my opinion and you never use it, I will stop giving it to you. Right. Or leave. Or, or leave. leave. So, or both. So, right. So what this has to be, if I can coin this up in one word, because I'm from Alabama, roll tide, right? <laughs> roll tide. Is genuine. Yes. Gen authentic. Genuine. Yes. Authentic. Yes. Authentic. Yes. And the best ideas need to win. That doesn't mean yes. I always win. Well, this is what I struggle with. Okay. And I, I mean, I struggle with this is I'm passionate about what we do. I have an opinion just about everything. And I love a good argument, the debate, right? And I will change my mind. Right. But during that discourse, it's not my intent, but I can make people feel like I'm beating them up. Well, no, you you can't make people feel anything. You can't make them feel that way. They feel that way based on them. So if so, I, I, this is something I had to figure out too. Is uh, a matter of fact, uh, in one of the organizations I was in, we brought in a you know consultant to help me because I I like you. I enjoy the debate. I enjoy the debate. I really do. I like the debate. Uh, but in order to keep people, so the three of us would we'll, would never be effective if we couldn't have the debate. We, 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 we'd have to be able to chop it up and all, but we've also all have a strong enough opinion and view of ourselves that we'd be okay if we didn't win that one. Cause we probably, we feel like we'll win the next one. Oh, so, we'll win the <laughs> next one. Yeah. Right? But people, not everybody is that way. And so how do we put this group together? How do we, how did we assemble this group? What types of skills and talents did we bring them to the table for? And we've got to create the, the so here's where the CEO part. I, I brought this person to the table because they bring a particular skill. And in that area, they've got to win more often even than I do. My financial person has got to win more often than I do. Otherwise, I don't need them. You see what I mean? They've right, got right, to know enough right. about it to be able to like, you see what I mean? That's why it's better to get people smarter than you. <laughs> You're less likely to challenge people when you know they're already smarter than you. You know yeah. it. Or, don't, or smarter than you in their subject area, right? That area. Like that, financial that, that, or yeah. um, mechanical or yes. 
you know, whatever it is that your company does, right? Yes. Um, if you're bringing in, and I'm going to use the financial institution that, that was in the paper, right? You're bringing in six people like yourself, right? And then you're going to, you're, you're thinking they're just all going to th think the same thing. So I'm just going to, I'm going to ask their opinion. And if they say something different, it doesn't really matter because they're all like me and they should be able to accept that we're going to go this way. Right. But if I hire six people different than myself and I know that they all have strengths and weaknesses and I can be authentic enough and genuine enough to, to, to say, okay, I, I'm not the smartest person. I'm smart, but I'm not the smartest person in the room at everything. That part. That's when you have the meeting, right? Because you're looking for something that that outfits a portion of the business plan, of decision making or whatever that is that is not your ballywick or whatever the the word the term is for it, right? Right, right, right. And 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 James, to your point, you again, you you know, you're pretty. Like a lot of CEOs. I mean, that's not unique to have the CEO, but be passionate, all that type of thing. But again, what outcome are you looking for? What kind of, do you want to have a company that is limited by your ideas, your skill, your ability? Your, you can have that. But frankly, that's one reason why I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have employees or anything that, because the responsibility to me is so significant. And I have such a high bar. I'm not sure if I can meet the bar. I mean, really, because I just, I, I, and, and frankly, you just, just describe James to a T, right? <laughs> I mean, he worries about his boys all the time. That's the thing. It's like, once you are responsible for yourself and like eight other people and other people, mouths to feed, right? It becomes a whole different yes. feel, right? Yes. And God, God love you, James, for, for having employees and, and all these things, because I'm like Dr. Daniels. I, I can I can barely meet my own bar. I move my own bar how, higher all the time, <laughs> and I don't want to subject somebody to that. I think yes. I think you're fair with your people. I know know you well enough, James, that that you're very fair, and that you are doing what you said the coach said about the players. You're treating people with the the level and the and and to their needs in order to bring that out in them. And well, I, I know I don't really have that capability. Comes. How you respond to failure. Oh, absolutely. Everybody's happy when we're winning. That's right. Okay. There are some people in my organization that can take a, a, a strong, what we used to call back in the day, butt chewing. Okay. There are some people in my organization, you have to be careful about how you approach them even with asking about project deadlines and things of that nature, because they get all worried. Oh, they're going to fire me. If you don't do this. I'm like, you've been with us for 15 years. Nobody's firing you. Okay. You're going to be fine. Really? But if you, if you say, Hey, what's going on with this project? I haven't gotten an update in a while. Oh, they're going to fire me. I'm going to lose my job. And then we got to give them a Xanax, a size of an Oreo cookie to get them through the next week. You know? Okay. So then yeah. I just put a lot of trust in those people and don't ask. Right. right. They, they're not they're, their makeup cannot handle that. Where right. some people I got to just like in football. Right. Some people I got to fire up. Some people I got to calm down. Right. 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 And so right. I think one of the worst things you can do as a CEO and they put this in this in this in this article. And I say CEO, I also say safety director, leader of any business unit, frontline foreman, anybody in a leadership uh, position is to respond to failure with artificial compassion. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Don't yeah. be fake. Well, and and, and James, I, I also think it's really, really important. So I don't believe you determine failure at the begin at the end of something. You determine failure at the beginning of something. So wh what is it gonna yeah. what? What does failure look like? And I ought to know that. Not be, you have to wonder, because if I don't know what it what failure looks like when I start, and you haven't told me, it didn't fail you when I get done. It's just, we didn't get the outcome we're looking for. Let's move on to the next one. So you yeah. chewing me, but whatever it is, for something that, how could I possibly have known or controlled or had any under awareness of that thing? That's an issue. That's an issue. That's it. You didn't know it either. Neither of us did. So until not, it happens, it, it, it stuff happens, stuff happens. So it is making sure that 
there is some objective measure of what failure and success is when we start. So the timeline on this is X. That's why we have those smart goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time frame, all that type stuff that what make it, what, what makes it a, a, a failure in this case, it's a failure to meet the timeline that we set, not that I set, we set it, we set it. We, we got in the room, we talked about this project uh, and I always tend to, you know, try to, you know, if somebody says it's going to, they're going to get a week, they need a week to do something, take three. So uh, take three, because stuff happens. See what I mean? Yeah. Uh, all under within promise reason. and over delivery. Within reason, right? Because and that's a negotiation. And exactly. you know, what I think is really interesting, because I have my uh, my PMP, my project management professional certification. And what, what you're getting at, right, is the idea of, like you said before, start with the ending in mind, right? That that's failure, success, something in between, break even, whatever, right? And you have a project charter, and everybody sits in the room, and and you set the deadlines, and you do the Gantt chart, and you do all these things ahead of time, and that's that's how you set yourself up for success. Now, I'm not saying in, in a small company that that's what you do, right? But but maybe the meetings are centered around here's what we have on our plate, right? Here's what we're doing. And here's, even if it's, even if it's simple, right? Here is the end goal of what we're doing. And then when they get the butt chewing that, that, you know, it's because we agreed on this, right? I, I didn't push you to the one week. I gave you three now and, and, and now you're at six. Okay. Right, it, right. No, and, and things happen. Exactly. Things happen. Right. But if, if none of those things happen and you're at six and there there's no explanation, then that's where we start to have, have the conversations that are uncomfortable, right? Well, yeah, um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but I mean, what's interesting is how all this kind of ties together, right? I mean, like, and I have the mind of a safety professional. I have a mind of the geologist. I have like all these competencies that don't match your competencies or whatever, but but it weaves into the management process. It weaves into the business plan. It weaves into continuity, it weaves in all these things. And that is a good CEO or a leader. You, you have to you have to work on those things and bring them all together in order to create buy-in, to create authenticity, to to create real compassion for what, what people are doing. And and the mistakes they're making or the successes they have. I so honestly, I, I mean, I don't know if that's. I, I the the part I'm going to add to you know because again I kind of feel compelled to is uh. I think that many systems are built, uh, with too much focus on failure and not enough focus on success. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so. It, so when folks are doing a great job, they hear nothing. When things go sideways, they hear lots of stuff. And so again, remember, we, we this conversation is around psychosocial hazards. People don't generally take, they don't take genuine compliments are not a threat, they're a reward. And mm -hmm. your brain does, it, it doesn't do gray area. It has gray matter, it doesn't do gray area in terms of perception. It's either a threat or a reward, period, that's it. Your brain is processing about 11 million bits of information per second and only pays attention to about 40 or 50 of them. And it's looking for the ones that are threats because that keeps you from getting eaten by a dinosaur, run over by a car, whatever. <laughs> it, it, it's your body. The amygdala fires up. That's a threat. How do I protect the rest of the body from that thing? That's why we react that way. So that's why people take the butt you butt chewing, the arguing, the, the raised voice. It's the threat. It's the potential of the threat. And we have, again, systems that are made up with lots of opportunity to give people threats and virtually none to give them reward. Where you're getting paid, that's not enough. It's not enough. Just simply give me a job and a promotion. That's not enough. People need to feel appreciated. They need to feel, and frankly, going back to that book, The Speed of Trust, it's like making deposits into this bank of trust that you give to people. You're going to have to make a withdrawal at some point, but there's some people, all you do is make withdrawals all the time. You didn't do this. This wasn't right. But, 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 all the time. And I never hear how this is as confident as I am. I still need to be, you know, like, I want to feel like I'm valued. I want to feel like I'm doing the right, right. thing. 
So if you look at your company's discipline policy and it's this big and you give no rewards, then there's a reason why people are leaving. There's a reason why you can't peak people because that feels like a threat. And that threat causes me to behave in such a way that says I'm leaving. So right, again, right. it's balancing those things. It's balancing. Why is it always? Blah, blah, blah. And, and, and perhaps the reason that the person didn't do it is that they, you know, they just found out that their mom has cancer. They just, you know, right. <laughs> they're having a financial struggle at home. It's got nothing to do with work, nothing to do. It's affecting work, but it didn't come from work. Do you care enough then? Do you care enough at that point to give them a lighter load? And to, so when a person doesn't meet a deadline, it's not because they couldn't. It might be because they just didn't because they were focused on something else that was probably more important at the time, but we just don't dig for that. Let's find out. Let's find out why. And let's not assume that this is a bad person. We need Because, you know, that, there are a limited number of people who can work in whatever environment that we're in. And it's important that we continue to reinvest in those people and not always be looking for a new one all the time. Right. right. Well, Dr. Daniels, it has been great having you. I'd love to go for another two hours to, <laughs> to flesh this out because uh, I learned a lot and I think our listeners learn a lot and it, it gives us things to digest and, and take home and try to improve our organizations, you know, I think as leaders, uh, kind of quoting from the article, we want the best of both worlds. We want, to quote, all voices heard and considered, failure acknowledged and learned from, feedback offered clearly and received graciously, but we also want harmony, comfort, and a, cease of, a sense of equilibrium. The good news is that you can have both, but you just can't have one without the other. That's right. So That's right. thank you for coming again. Uh, if our listeners would like to get in touch with you, because I know you've got a consulting company that help helps organizations navigate these waters, how best would they uh, would they contact you? So um, my company is uh, ID2 Solutions. Our website is id2-solutions.com. Uh, you can kind of you can contact me there. Uh, I'm pretty uh, active on LinkedIn at as my social media platform of choice. Um, if they, you know, if the, I think if they find either one of you all, you can pass the, uh, the word along. I, I, and I want to be 100%. really, 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 really clear that the United States is behind in this regard and we can catch up and we can catch up fast. We don't have, we, we've got a number of other countries who've done this work in, in terms of psychological health and safety, and we can catch up quick if we want to. So, and I'm glad to help if folks want to be able to do that. Well, thank you again, thank you, Dr. Dr. Daniels. Daniels. Thank we you. appreciate you. My and honor. to all of our listeners, thank you for listening in on Spotify and on YouTube, over on YouTube. Go down there, hit that smash that like button, hit subscribe. That way you can be notified uh, when we have a new podcast that, that drops. Podcasts drop every Tuesday, sometimes uh, sometime around lunch, a little bit thereafter. But if you subscribe on Spotify, it'll also send you a notification. But until next time, this is James Junkin and Dr. Martin on the Risk Matrix. Y'all keep bringing those workers home safe. <laughs>